You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Allstate wants to remind fans that mayhem is everywhere. Like at your pregame barbecue. While you prep your meats, that grease trap you forgot to empty is prepping to smoke your porch, garage, and the car inside. And without the right home and auto insurance coverage, the cost to repair this could eat up your savings. So bundle home and auto with Allstate to save and get protected from mayhem like this. Bundled savings vary and are not available in every state. Coverage is subject to policy terms and conditions. Sweat. (laughs) You mean armpit tears of weakness brought about by poor deodorant choices? Say goodbye to that salty river that floweth from your underarm with Old Spice Swagger Antiperspirant. Made for 24-7 sweat protection with daily use and an undeniable smell of cedarwood and lime. Mmm. Giving you the confidence you need to quit your job, move to a remote island, and spend your days frolicking with dolphins. Old Spice Swagger Antiperspirant. Shop Old Spice now. On the fake. Rodgers lets it fly, has Watson, he's got it on his feet and he's in for the touchdown! That might be the biggest catch of this young receiver's career for Christian Watson. You can see him, it's just press man. They talk about his speed, his ability to get behind the defense. It's just a matter of can he catch it. That's a great job tracking the ball. He just took a big sigh of relief. Look at his buddies greeting him on the sideline, man. That's got to feel good. What's up, guys? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access if you'd like to email the show you can send a message to packers total access at gmail.com if you'd like to text the show send us a text message to 865-658-5824 again that's 865-658-5824 we are in full-blown aaron Rodgers watch mode (laughs) all right now we are not going to fill the entire show up with it um we're just going to give you the latest update as it comes in and, um, yeah, we'll just kind of move along, and uh, we're going to answer some text messages today from some listeners, kind of spark up a little tight end conversation. We've touched on it previously, but I'm going to go a little more in depth with how I feel about the tight end class, as well as tight ends in free agency this year and all of that. So we got, like I said, two listener questions, and we're also going to kind of walk down memory lane. A listener um, actually asked the question, what were my favorite Aaron Rodgers moments? So we are going to hit on those as we get ready to wrap up. And before we sign off, we will check Twitter one more time and make sure we're not missing any any updates on the Aaron Rodgers situation. However, we do have a a couple of little nuggets that are coming in. I I did see come across the board here or across the uh, ticker, Ian Rappaport, Sharon Zadarius Smith's tweet. Zadarius Smith's tweet basically says, I just want to say thank you to Skull Nation for an amazing season and experience. Thank you to all of my teammates, coaches, and the entire Minnesota Vikings organization. So, Sounds like they are parting ways. No big surprise there, but Zadarius lasted one year in Minnesota. And, uh, yeah, I would say it's uh, it wasn't a successful run for Zadarius there. Um, it was kind of up and down, uh, a few injuries here and there, and he didn't really perform at the level I don't think he was expecting to perform at. But uh, Ian shared that and said, Vikings Pro Bowl bat- pass rusher Zadarius Smith informed the team that he wants to be released, I'm told. The team has has no plans to do that. The situation remains unresolved. So he's trying to you know, post this picture, him with teammates and coaches, shows him there with uh, Mike Pettin in the NFC North title uh, t-shirt on as well as someone else with him and then it shows him in the in the Vikings uniform kind of celebrate and just says I want to say thank you to Skull Nation so he's basically saying hey goodbye appreciate you guys appreciate the love it was fun we won the north um you know yeah not going to be here next year and then Ian comes out which we know I've said this over and over guys and gals Ian Rappaport is the mouthpiece for the league. Therefore, he's the mouthpiece for each individual team. Therefore, he's the mouthpiece for the Minnesota Vikings. What does he come out and say? I guarantee you he reached out to the team or his quote-unquote sources, right, within the Vikings organization and said, hey, did you guys release this area Smith? And I'm sure that they said, no, we did not do that. He wants us to, but we're not planning on doing that. 
And here's Ian now tweeting, saying the Vikings Pro Bowl pass rusher Zadarius Smith informed the team he wants to be released. I'm told the team has no plans to do that. So there is some internal strife going on with the Minnesota Vikings. And, uh, it, you know, it looks like – isn't it funny? Zadarius wanted to stay in Green Bay. They decided, hey, look, the cap hit's too large. We're cutting him loose. He goes to Minnesota. He lasts one year there. You know, he wanted to be in Green Bay, right? Now, we all know that he had a little bit of a falling out with the whole captain issue and all that stuff. Goes to Minnesota last one freaking year and already wants out. I just think that's hilarious. Couldn't happen to a better team. Now, let's get into the show. <clears throat> so, we had a listener uh, question here through text, and this came in from, gosh, let's see if I can find it here. I hope I can. Um, yes, okay. So, this comes in from Jack uh, from Panama. Said hello, Clayton. Jack from Panama. Uh, yeah, Jack from Panama here. I've noticed you aren't hopping tight end as much as you were a little while ago. Why is that? And who are your top tight end choices this off season? So, thank you for the text message, Jack. I just want to say this: when it comes to the tight end position, and he's right. You guys know uh, toward the end of the year there, what I did was I pointed out that during the playoffs, how every team in the playoffs had a solid tight end, right? You know, they didn't have they didn't have tight ends that were like not not all of them had tight ends that were all world tight ends. I mean, of course, you had Kittle, who's, you know, one of, if not the best tight ends in the game. Right. You had, um, uh, of course, Kelsey, who I think is probably the best tight end in the game right now uh, in Kansas City. You had your Dalton Schultz as you had all, all these teams. You knew who the number one tight end was in Green Bay. You couldn't say that, you know, Mercedes Lewis was Lewis was the best blocker. Right. So it's, a lot of times they had him attached to the line, right? And then the best pass catcher, if you will, was probably Robert Tunyon, although he was coming off an ACL. But you wouldn't consider uh, Robert Tunyon a, a solid blocker, right? Although I will never forget when he knocked uh, the Bosa boy out with that crackback block against San Fran. That's, oh, man, that was one of my favorite plays. I believe it was the year before last. Not this last season we just finished up, but the season before Crack back block block on, I believe it's Nick. Yeah, Nick Bosa. And just absolutely peeled his cap. One of my favorite plays from the tight end position as a Packer fan of all time. He just decleated him, right? But Tunyon is not known for his blocking. And let's be honest. It wasn't like he squared up on Bosa and handled business. He caught Bosa off guard and cracked him. <laughs> and, and, hey, I wasn't saying it at the time. It was like, look, Bosa can't hold his own against Tunyon, right? I'm, I'm talking as much trash as anybody because you guys know I'm a Packer fan first and foremost, but Tunyon is not a good blocker, okay? So you've got the pass catcher in Tunyon. You've got the the attached inline blocker in Mercedes Lewis, although Mercedes Lewis had made some nice catches, right? And then you've got Josiah DeGuara, who's quote-unquote the H-back, although we don't like to use the fullback uh, that often. So it's more of a more of that H role, but they like to, you know, do a little bit of motion at the tight end position, things like that. It's very seldom that he's in the backfield. Uh, definitely not as much as you see in San Francisco there with their 21 looks. Um, and then, of course, you had Tyler Davis, who I think we would all agree Tyler Davis is not a good blocker. He's not a good pass catcher. He's not a good route runner. Um, now, is he backup quality? Probably. I think he's NFL level, you know, uh, tight end. There's no doubt in my mind about that. I mean, he made the roster, and at times he did his job. Right. But you don't have that tight end <clears throat> on this roster that you go, that's the number one tight end. That's the tight end. Dallas Goddard was that in Philly. No, no, no question about it. Hayden Hurst was that in Cincinnati. No question about it. Dalton Schultz was that in Dallas. No question about it. On and on and on. Right. Obviously, Kittle in San Francisco, Kelsey in Kansas City, and across the board. So, you know, I did mention that during the playoffs, you know, every team, every playoff team had a solid tight end, and we couldn't say that. Maybe it's time we stop neglecting the tight end position, especially in this, um, this, uh, you know, uh, Sean McVay slash uh, Matt LaFleur offense, right? Because, you know, again, I, I differentiate the two. I really do because there's so many people that have gotten confused. And I love following Dusty Evely on Twitter because he puts people in their place and he does it in the nicest way possible. He's not out there to argue and he's not going to waste time arguing with people. But, when when they see Jordan Love complete a pass across the middle, a short you know a short crosser, immediately people that hate Aaron Rodgers go yeah. If Aaron, you know, it's amazing what will happen when you run the system and this and that. And then Dusty simply points out, "Come on, dude, we've watched Aaron complete that pass over and over and over and over. Stop pretending like he's not running the offense. It's silly, right? Because they see they see Shanahan 
in San Francisco, and they immediately always hear the talking heads, the pundits talking about, well, Green Bay, they run the Shanahan offense. They do not run the Shanahan offense. It all came from Shanahan, yes, but they run the McVay-style offense. That's what they do. Okay, so, again, didn't want to get off on that rant, but it is what it is. I'm simply pointing out that the Green Bay Packers need a solid number one tight end. It doesn't mean you go out and break the bank. You know, everybody immediately came after you. Yeah, sign me up a Kelsey. I'll take a Travis Kelsey since they're just growing on trees. Nobody's saying that. I'm simply saying that Green Bay doesn't have a number one tight end. So to answer your question, Jack, in Panama, I wonder if that's Panama City, Florida. I've been there several times or if that's uh, another Panama, you know. I'm not – yeah, I shouldn't even be commenting on this, to be honest with you. I'm so – I am so stupid when it comes to things other than history. <laughs> it's not even funny. It's literally history is the only thing that I can hold my own in a conversation of of anyone else who has any intelligence beyond a third grade level. And I'm just being real. Um, but anyway, Jack, thank you for the for the tight end. So I have not. I'm not trying to pull away from the tight end position, but the reason I have with draft talk is because it doesn't kind of line up. You know, um, I'm first of all, let's start with free agency. I'm not a big fan of the tight ends in this year's free agency. I'm not. And some of these tight ends in here are some of the names I just mentioned, you know, that are going to be free agents. Let's just kind of go down the list here. According to PFF, the top available. And to the best of my knowledge, none of these have been franchise tagged. Now they aren't up to date. Actually, Evan Ingram. Yes. Evan Ingram has been franchise tagged in Jacksonville. But Jacksonville is looking solid, guys. Jacksonville, you know, the playoff team, they just franchise tagged. They're tied in. Not a coincidence, right? But they just got Calvin Ridley, who's coming off suspension. Guys, Calvin Ridley was a solid wide receiver, a very good wide receiver. And, of course, they've got Christian Kirk down there. They signed him free agency last year. They got – what do they got, guys? Two solid number one receivers, and they've got a solid tied in. Now – Evan Ingram, I want you to think about this. Evan Ingram was franchise tagged, to the best of my knowledge, and it's fully guaranteed, of course, right? It's uh, one year, $11.3 million, right? Guaranteed one year. That's the franchise tag they put on him, okay? So with that being said, what was his market value? His market value was over $13 million. Actually, it's showing $14 million here, according to PFF. PFF is probably not the best site to get projected contract value. I like to do, I like to lean on Spotrack for that information or even over the cap. But again, they had him at an, at an average per year, four years, $14 million per year. Because, of course, Evan Ingram's 28 years old. They, they, they could justify doing a four-year deal, which is actually a two based on the structure and the guaranteed and all that stuff you could probably get out of it. Out of that contract within two years, no problem. But nonetheless, 11.35 guys, they saved themselves, what, 2.7 million, right? Three, yeah, 2.7 million. 2.7 million they saved themselves by slapping the franchise tag on them. Now, if you sign an extension, you've got a lot, a lot more room to play the cash over cap game and maneuver the salary cap around or to free up cap room here or there. They just wanted to go ahead and write the one big check and be done with it, right? So, Dalton Schultz, who's the 20th ranked uh, overall free agent, the number one tight end free agent, according to PFF, um, his projected contract is $14.5 million. So basically 500 k more than what Evan Ingram's was. Okay. Now, why do I mention all that? I am not overpaying for these tight ends. Not going to do it. Okay. Yes, I am the guy who said we need a tight end. But it's got to be a starting – it's got to be a – if you're going to pay top dollar on the market, then it better be a damn good tight end. Not someone who's just, okay, they're, they might be the best on the market, but that doesn't make them a great tight end, right? I think Dalton Schultz is a good tight end, but he's not worth $14.5 million to me. So what's he going to do? He's going to test the market, right? Um, would I sign Dalton Schultz to that franchise tag, that amount, a four-year $11 million? I probably wouldn't. And the reason being is because this year's tight end uh, class in this year's draft is absolutely stacked, guys. And what do I mean by stacked? There's two, in my opinion, first-round talent tight ends, and we'll talk about them here in a second. And there's multiple that can be taken early in the second or throughout the second round. So these teams, not only can they get probably a higher ceiling player, right, someone who's going to um, have a higher ceiling if their scouting department knocks it out of the park, and they're accurate on their assessment 
of that rookie's talent, the you know incoming rookie's talent, that's going to surpass a Dalton Schultz. Plus, you're getting them for much, much cheaper. I mean, if you if you were to take one of these tight ends in the second round, you're looking at a probably a two million dollar per year, two to three million dollars per year. I don't have the rookie slotting scale in front of me. Let's just call it three million per year. And here they've got a higher ceiling, and by the end of the year, they would be just as good as a Dalton Schultz. And here somebody's going to pay Dalton Schultz fourteen million dollars. That's eleven million dollars, gang, that you could have spent elsewhere on your roster instead of signing a free agent tied in at that price. Now, I don't think these guys are going to get that kind of money. I really don't. Now, Evan Ingram getting the franchise tag, that's the only thing to go off of right now, right? That's what the league and the CBA have deemed a fair market value for a top tied in. So guess where teams are going to start negotiating with Dalton Schultz? I guarantee you the first offer they get coming in, the first thing they're going to do is slap that franchise tag contract down and go, well, Evan Ingram just got the franchise tag, so that's assuming that's top dollars, $11.3 million. How much would you like? Let's say he says, I want 14 and a half. Now, the team's got to determine, is it worth it for us to go out there and offer 12, meet in the middle at 13? Shave, a, shave one and a half million off the overall uh, expense of the contract. Or do they get really aggressive and go, you know what, we've got two tight ends in this draft that could be significantly cheaper with a lot more upside that could turn out to be an absolute superstar, way better than Dalton Schultz, right? So they're going to lean on this class. What that means is if, when the tight end market, any market is – is uh, any class in the draft is stacked, it equals a cold market in free agency in my opinion, unless, of course, there are some superstars. If there was a Rob Gronkowski from five years ago in this, in this free agency, listen, when the game's on the line, you think player's not player. Do you think players not play, right? So if you've got a generational talent, if Travis Kelsey, Rob Gronkowski, all of them in their prime, in the, you know, like Dalton Schultz is age 26 years old, and they were hitting the market, heck yeah, I'd be willing to pay top dollar because you're talking about game-changing top play level, right? But that's not the case here. So when the tight end position is stacked in, in the draft, that means you've got a cold market. I expect these tight ends, when offers start coming in during free agency frenzy, which to the best of my knowledge starts Sunday afternoon, that's really exciting. We're going to be covering all that. Um, I think you'll see the tight end market be a little bit cold. Now, the the total number might come in, and, and, it, and it appears as if it's going to be $14.5 million average per year. But this thirty-six million guaranteed they got right now, if it's if it truly is a cold market, it might just end up being twenty million guaranteed, and the overall might look the same, right? That's where you got to kind of look at the hard deal and the soft deal, and we'll, we'll get into that in another podcast. I don't want to go too deep or down any any rabbit trails here. I've I've really been trying to stay out of the rabbit holes here lately, guys. I want to stay on topic, and it never it never fails. When I go back and critique myself and try to listen to the pod, it's so hard to do hearing your own voice. Oh, it sucks. I'm doing it right now. I'm going down a rabbit hole right now explaining to you why I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. So you know what? I'm just going to stop right now. I'm just going to say that we're going to try to stay on topic and stick to the notes from here on out. So um, here's what I would do if I'm the Green Bay Packers, Jack. And this is why I haven't talked about tidy much. I mentioned this about a week or two ago, and to me it still stands. When you go down this list, you got Dalton Schultz. Of course, Evan Ingram's off the market now. You got Mike Gusecki at eleven million per year. Hayden Hurst at eight and a half million per year. Austin Hooper eight and a half million per year. Foster Moreau at seven million per year. Irv Smith Jr. at four four point uh, two five million per year. Um, when you look at those, to me, you got to you got to look at the PFF grade. You got to look at what they did here recently and try to understand. Okay, why are why are they carrying that value? And every one of them, there's none of them that grab my attention. The one that probably, if if there's one on the market that I would say, you know what, if they deserve it, it's that person. It's definitely Dalton Schultz. PFF grade last year, 68.3. 2021, it was 78.2. Okay. He showed that he can play at a solid level. And 68.3 isn't horrible, right? It's not what you want in a 14 million per year tied in, obviously. Uh, Hayden Hurst, 64.5 last year. Now, he backed – his previous two years were in the 50s. So, I, I don't feel comfortable giving him $8.5 million personally. Austin Hooper, 68.8, 64.2, 69.8. A little more consistent. He's going to turn 29 this year. That plays a role. I'm not giving him $8.5 million. Maybe closer to five, right? 
Foster Moreau, he's 25 years old, but his PFF grade 61.1, 56.4, and a 67.2. Not feeling it. Irv Smith Jr. piques my interest because he's only 24 years old. And in 2020, his PFF grade was 70.0. Of course, he missed 2021 from injury. And then last year came back and bombed out at a, at a 56.4. So who's up next on the list? If you're going to go with someone who's that low graded, right, then why not go with someone who's already knows your system? Because next on the list is Robert Tunyon. Robert Tunyon, 57.7, 54.6, 68.6. His PFF grade was horrible in 2021, guys. Now, I know he tore his ACL. The year before, the 68.6 was inflated, too, with uh, statistics, you know, with touchdown catches. Of course, that doesn't – come into play in my opinion with pff I, I, I like to think and imagine and keep my head in the sand that they're not taking into consideration statistics they are strictly grading the tape and based off assignment and how he played but bob tunyon isn't like gangbusters right they're saying he's worth five million average per year i'm not giving bob tunyon five million per year but i'll tell you this i would be willing to give him three million per year no doubt about it now, why do I think he might be available for $3 million per year? Simply because a stacked tight end draft class equals a cold tight end free agent market. Okay, that's kind of how I'm seeing that. Now, the next guy on the list, Mercedes Lewis. Mercedes, all signs indicate that Mercedes wants to play again. Okay, now here's what's crazy. Aaron's going to the Jets. Mercedes Lewis is one of those guys that Aaron has really taken a liking to, right? So if Mercedes Lewis comes back and he does want to break that record for age of tight end, I believe there's a, some kind of record on the line for uh, catching a pass um, for a tight end his age, which he will be 39 years old. His PFF grade last year is 65.6. The year before, 75.1. He was the eighth overall graded tight end in the entire National Football League. Um, and then in 2020, it was a 66.9. Guys, it's saying his projected contract value is 3.25. If the Jets go after him because they get Aaron Rodgers, then I would probably be willing to go. You know, it, let's say the Jets go at him and they say we want to give you two and a half million. I'd be willing to go three and a half million for Mercedes Lewis. Now you'd like to get him for cheaper, and who knows the Jets? The Jets may put their foot down on Aaron Rodgers too and say, "Nope, ain't gonna happen, bub." You know that could be the case. We don't know how that's gonna turn out. We don't even know if he's gonna. Uh, even play next year. He might retire. He may get traded to the Jets. He may even come back to the Packers. A lot of people aren't even talking about that. But to answer your question, Jack, the way I look at the tight end position, if I'm going to sign any of these free agents for me, I'm going after Tunyon for three million and Mercedes Lewis for two and a half to three million. Maybe three and maybe maybe three and a half million. I would go as as high as that for Mercedes Lewis. Why? The only guy on your roster right now is DeGuara. Okay, now you've got some other guys who are signed. I get that. We know right now it's just kind of filling the roster. But Mercedes Lewis is a guy I want back in my locker room. Guys, if we had three tight ends on the roster already, I wouldn't feel this way. But there's already holes to fill, and this is a guy who can mentor and teach young tight ends. Could you imagine Mercedes Lewis on the same roster as a Michael Mayer or a Dalton Kincaid? Now, according to Jack, he's like, hey, you ain't been talking about this, and, and you darn sure ain't been talking about taking him at 15 here lately because I now have my board falling into place, and I'm seeing the overall value of Michael Mayer and Dalton Kincaid. I'm not suggesting that you reach and take them in the first round. We're talking second round. We'll get to that in a second. But imagine Mercedes Lewis, Lewis um, coaching these guys up as a, as a veteran player on the roster and still playing that role. And we've seen last year, he can still catch the football. He can still block. He's still as good as he, he as he's been in, a, you know, in quite some time. He's just, he's one of those guys that you know what you've got. You've got a solid 65 to 75 PFF grade and someone who's not going to blow an assignment. He can hold his own blocking. He can catch the football when he needs to. But unfortunately, he doesn't have wheels like some of the more dynamic tight ends in the National Football League. But Mercedes Lewis is the one I'm going after here in free agency. I'm locking him up. You've got DeGuara playing H, which I'm not thrilled with, but again, Mercedes Lewis. And then you get into the draft and you go, okay, we need a couple tight ends in this draft. It's, it's, it is stacked with tight ends right now, which makes me think teams are going to be a little bit hesitant. You know, isn't it funny? Uh, it's it's a, this little dichotomy, like in free agency, the market could be cold because the draft's so stacked, but the draft's so stacked that it might cause teams to pass up on tight ends early in the draft because they know there's other options late. And that may make a position go cold in the draft the same as it would in free agency. 
So what I mean there is, let's say a team comes up and they and they have their board set just like mine. I'm not suggesting that that's what it is, but we're just going to pretend for a second, play play along with me, that every team in the National Football League, their draft board set up like mine. So when we come to the number 15 pick for the Packers, you're going to have Michael Mayer available and Dalton Kincaid available, and they are both in Tier 6, okay? So when you look at that in Tier 6, yes, they're in Tier 6, but number 22 and number 24 in the draft. Guys, if there's somebody who's, you know, Lucas Van Ness, at, uh, you know, the 17 on my board, and he's, uh, what, let's see here, uh, two tiers higher than both of these tight ends, I'm going with Lucas Van Ness over that tight end. Now, when we talk about there being multiple options of tight end in this specific draft this year, and they might drop because teams know they could get one of equal or maybe a little lesser value, uh, but uh, but you know a little lesser talent, but more value later in the draft. Um, if that's the case, then these players start to drop. What I would be willing to do for Michael Mayer and Dalton Kincaid, take the best player available at number 15, assuming you don't trade up or down in this draft, okay? And you don't have an extra draft pick uh, that might come from the Jets. We don't know what the draft compensation will be. We'll talk about that here in a second as we get ready to wrap up. But um, I would be willing to trade up in the second, much like you did for Christian Watson last year, to take either Michael Mayer or Dalton Kincaid. So if I'm the Packers, and the draft board falls away, I think it is. And Lucas Van Ness is the best on the board. Of course, he, he probably wouldn't be the best on board. Let's let's say that Miles Murphy, who's number 15 on my board, he's the best available when the Packers pick. Or even better, number 14 on my board. Let's say Broderick Jones from Georgia falls down, right? Just a touch, just one, one mark, and he's available when the Packers pick. Goose just got excited. If Goose is listening to this podcast, he's going. Boy, if Broderick falls to them, I'm going to go crazy, <laughs> right? That's how I truly feel about Peter Skaronsky. But uh, Peter Skaronsky, Paris Johnson, and Broderick Jones, I feel like you can't go wrong with, with any of them. And the way the board falls, Broderick is the lesser of all of those. Actually, I got him and Paris Johnson tied at 12.3 at in value on my critical board. So uh, both of those guys are absolutely neck and neck, which is really cool because Paris Johnson doesn't even have an RAS uh, bonus yet, which I'm assuming he would test out pretty well. Broderick obviously crushed it. So Paris may climb up a little bit there. Uh, that's why I still see Broderick Jones kind of in our wheelhouse. But let's assume Broderick Jones is the best player available. We take him at number 15. OK, so now we're watching the tight end position. Let's say we get to 20 and no tight ends are taken yet. Let's say we get to 25 and Michael Mayer gets taken. OK, so now the best available is Dalton Kincaid. You've got to ask yourself, self, is it worth it to trade up right now and get Dalton Kincaid? Probably not. So you wait it out because, you know, right behind him, you've got a Luke Musgrave. And right behind him, you've got a, a a Darnell Washington, right? Now, Luke Musgrave is a Tier 8. Of course, Michael Mayer and Dalton Kincaid are Tier 6s. And then Darnell Washington's a Tier 9. I've actually got him lower than Luke Musgrave at the moment. Both Mus Luke Musgrave and Darnell Washington have their RAS bonuses, too. So they're pretty well set. When, uh, when, I, when I catch wind of – who uh, Greg Cosell's favorite is in this draft, they'll get a little bit of a bump, and that might, might end up being the tiebreaker. He might not mention either of them. Hell, Greg Cosell might come out and completely baffle me and say this is a weak tight end class. Guess what? Based off my information, it suggests it's a strong tight end class, but I put a lot of stock in Greg Cosell. That man's been watching NFL film football for way, way, way longer than I've been alive. Why would I not listen to him? It would take some kind of ego to go, no, nah, my formula is more important than Greg Cosell's opinion. right? That's why I take his opinion very, very uh, – I don't know. I put a lot of value on it. I take it very, very strongly. So um, with that being said, I'm willing to trade up in the second. Let's say that Michael Mayer doesn't go until 28, and then we get to like the third or fourth pick in the second round maybe even the second pick of the second round, kind of like, you know, let's paint the exact same scenario Christian Watson had last year. Michael Mayer's off the board, right? Dalton Kincaid sitting there. We're at pick 34. Let's climb up and take Dalton Kincaid because at that point, at that pick in the draft, again, where do I have Dalton Kincaid on my critical board? Number 24. He's, a tw he's worthy of the 24th pick, and here we're sitting at 34, and he's still available. Climb up. Because you're willing, you're willing to trade future draft picks, 
or you know compensation, whether it's a player that's that's way more rare than people want to pretend like it is, but you give up a little extra compensation because you're you're actually getting a player of greater value than the current pick suggests is equal to the tier that you should be able to get a player at that at that specific pick. So you could trade up in the second round and getting a Dalton Kincaid. Now, Dalton Kincaid may go first, and it's Michael Mayer sitting there. You're going to hear me jumping up and down if that's the case because you guys know I'm a huge Michael Mayer fan. But Dalton Kincaid is right there in the same tier. You know, Michael Mayer's got a 21 grade. Dalton Kincaid's got a 22. I mean, they're neck and neck. And Dalton Kincaid doesn't even have his bonus yet. So if he if he comes out with a uh, a pro day and he gets a maximum bonus – he is in he being Dalton Kincaid. He's going to leapfrog Michael Mayer. And and I'm sorry, guys. I'm a Notre Dame fan, but if the board suggests that Dalton Kincaid is better than Michael Mayer, I want Dalton Kincaid. And if 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 Greg Cosell comes out and puts his stamp of approval on him as well over Michael Mayer, guess what? He's going to climb even further up the board. But as it sits right now, I'm willing to trade up in the early early in the second round to get one of these tight ends. So that's why I haven't been talking about it here lately, Jack, is because the board now falls to a point where it's like I can't justify taking one of those tight ends with the number 15 pick. However, the Packers may have uh, Michael Michael Mayer or Dalton Kincaid or even Luke Musgrave or maybe even Darnell Washington ranked as a top-tier talent in the entire draft, even higher than Bryce Young. I, I personally don't believe that's the case, but if that's the case, I trust their board over mine. Right. So it all comes down to – the critical board setting the stage to build your horizontal board so you can then determine where's the depth sit in what rounds for each position and where do we need to pull the trigger and be aggressive trading up or be a little bit conservative and trading back. I'm of the opinion that when the Packers pick at 15, I think we may have anywhere from three to five prospects that are worthy of that draft pick. So when that happens, right, and you don't have a huge glaring need, you trade back. It's going to tick a lot of people off but I feel like this is the draft that the Packers could trade back. Now, if a Tier 1 player, let's say Will Anderson for some reason, you know, he's he's in a Tier 2, right? There's only two players in Tier 2. There's Bryce Young in Tier 1, uh, Jalen Carter and Will Anderson in Tier 2, and then, of course, on and on and on. Let's say Will Anderson begins to drop, and we get to the 8th or ninth pick, and Will Anderson being a Tier 2 prospect because these quarterback, everybody gets, you know, quarterback – uh, happy they fall in love with the QBs and let's say Will Anderson is somehow there at number eight or even number six and the Packers want to trade up and get him I could see that being a scenario because you're going for a current top tier talent and the differential between where you're originally picking and where you're looking to climb up to is equal or greater value than the compensation you're going to have to give up to get to that spot hopefully that makes sense it's so hard to describe this on a podcast and I hope we're getting the message across. Uh, it's a lot easier when you do a PowerPoint. You know, I'm, I'm used to PowerPoints and things like that and doing, you know, face-to-face -face calls in business and business and being able to use a virtual whiteboard to point things out. It's, it's so difficult to convey this, especially when you're a horrible communicator like I am. So, um, so Luke Musgrave is in tier eight. Now let's assume both of those players are gone. We don't have a shot, right? Then you're picking at number 15 in the second round, right? So that would be – and I don't know all about the uh, compensatory picks. I should know that. I have a podcast. I get it. But let's assume it's 47, whatever it is, right? And we're picking it, you know, at or around that spot, 47. So when we come to 47, guess what? If Darnell Washington or Luke Musgrave is still available, it's the same thing that applies to the first round. Maybe they're willing to trade up at that point to grab one of those guys because the value is still there. Right. Or maybe, you know, at, at that point right there, they're still on the board and you just go ahead and take the best of those two. Now, you, you would prefer Luke Musgrave as the board sets right now over Darnell Washington. I know a lot of people hear that and go, what are you talking about? That's what the board says. So like every front office, you got to stick with the board. You can't let a combine where people, you know, absolutely blow your mind, run around in their, in their underwear and, and pushing uh, sleds and all that stuff. You've got to remember the tape. And the beautiful thing about the board that I've created and the system I've created is we did not let that combine influence the base version of our critical board before these bonuses were added in. And it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, so... Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. 
Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Allstate wants to remind fans that mayhem is everywhere, like at your pregame barbecue. While you prep your meats, that grease trap you forgot to empty is prepping to smoke your porch, garage, and the car inside. And without the right home and auto insurance coverage, the cost to repair this could eat up your savings. So bundle home and auto with Allstate to save and get protected from mayhem like this. Bundled savings vary and are not available in every state. Coverage is subject to policy terms and conditions. Welcome to the Pants Cast, brought to you by Lululemon, a show about all things pants. My guest is Matt James, former NCAA player and Lululemon ABC pant enthusiast. Hi, great to be here. Matt, tell us all about those ABC pants. The comfort? They're like the pants I put on when I don't want to wear pants. Versatility? You could wear these pants to a wedding, but you could also wear these to a cookout. And what about style? They're like if casual and cool had a baby. Well, it's clear why you're an ABC enthusiast. Pleasure having you and your pants on the show. Thanks for having us. Find the shockingly comfortable ABC pants at lululemon.com. That's kind of how I see the tight end position, Jack. Hopefully that explained it, man. I hope it wasn't too confusing, but um, it's just going to be one of those things, man. How is the board going to fall? How's the board going to fall? And I believe the fact that this tight end class in this year's draft is so stacked, especially at least four or five deep, that it may slow down and cool down the free agent market. Now, you may see some tight ends fly off the board. You may see Dalton Schultz fly off the board real quick, right? And let's say he does – and it says it's a, a $60 million total contract, or you, you know what I mean, the, the total value of the contract, $60 million. And the originally they said four years, $14.5 million per year, $58 million total. Let's say it's 60 But here they're showing $36 million guaranteed. The number you want to pay attention to is the guaranteed. <clears throat> it's the same exact thing that we talked about with Preston Smith and other players. Like when they sign their extension, it's like, oh, man, overall, he, he got paid pretty good per year. Look at the guarantee. Look when they can get out and look how they can restructure, right? And, and that's where you're dangling the carrot to be able to convert these roster bonuses and this base salary to a signing bonus and put a little bit more guaranteed money in their pocket. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he cracked $60 million. Somebody might get stupid and overpay for Dalton Schultz, but that, that guaranteed money might not be $36 million, It might be $28, right? And that's where the team knows, okay, within two years we could cut loose of them. Or we, we, we are going to be in the driver's seat as far as negotiations. And we could do like we did with Aaron Jones and say, hey, here's a restructure. You got two options. We're either going to cut you loose and you got to risk – um, we're going to cut you loose after this year, and you got to risk injury this year, knowing that when we cut cut you loose next year, you're going to miss out on a ton of guaranteed money. But what if we convert a little bit of this bonus to signing bonus to give you an extra three million in your pocket, guaranteed, a little insurance in case you do get hurt, but we we shave off five million off the overall contract. That's how the negotiating is done. <clears throat> so with that being said, we're going to move on. Hopefully that. Um, that connected there, Jack. But the, the big thing I have in big, bold letters here on my notes, man, do not reach. 
don't you dare reach for a tight end in this draft because it's loaded. That's the way I see it. So with that being said, let's move on to the Aaron Rodgers updates. Okay. I know everybody's been waiting on this. So <laughs> there's some that are going, yep. There's others that are going, nope. I'm so tired of hearing about this. I can't see straight. And I'm kind of falling into the ladder right now, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. So I'm just checking Twitter real quick, make sure I'm not missing on anything else. There's a, a couple of heavy hitters here that are tweeted. So let's just jump in and, and check that real quick. Make sure that we're not missing up on anything else. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay, so Tom Silverstein, why are you doing this, Tom? He's tweeting out about Packers draft picks, and I immediately thought, oh, my gosh, what is this? Like literally a tweet from 59 minutes ago says, Packers received two compensatory picks in this year's draft. And, and you see Packers received two draft picks. What do you think? The Aaron Rodgers trade hit? And it didn't. So <laughs> here we are. Um, all right, so let's do this. Let's go to the original tweet. This came from a Twitter account from I'd never heard of it before. They got like 40, 40 some thousand followers. It seems to be legit at U Stadium, okay, on Twitter. They tweeted Tom Pelissero. Um, this is at 202 earlier today. The Jets have worked Tom Pel per Tom Pelissero. The Jets have worked through the compensation and contract for Aaron Rodgers. It's up to him to let them and the Packers know what he wants to do. Mike Garofolo said the Jets won't rush Rodgers. Okay, that sounds pretty definitive, right? If you climb down in the comments, um, this guy Caleb commented on it and said, I just watched this exact clip, and an important part that was omitted is that the Jets have not agreed to comp compensation with the Packers. They've worked through, quote, what they would want to offer them. That's what they've worked through. That little blurb you wrote implied that a bit. Just wanted to clarify, okay? So let's move on to the next tweet. This comes from Zach Cruz from Tom Pelissero on NFL Network. Quote, Jets know in their minds what they are willing to do in terms of the draft pick compensation that would go to the Packers in the trade, as well as what they would do to Rodgers' contract. Nothing about greed upon compensation between New York Jets and Green Bay. So that original tweet, it's obvious that Tom Pelissero kind of fumbled his words. That guy was tweeting out the proper, the, the exact quote and everything. The other guy caught it that I think he might have threw in a little blurb, and Zach Cruz on Twitter is actually confirming that as well a couple hours later. So nothing has been agreed upon. It's just the Jets know in their minds what they are willing to do in terms of the draft pick compensation and what they were willing to do to the Packers uh, in the trade, as well as Rodgers' contract. OK, so they've got a roundabout estimate of what it is they're wanting in compensation and what they would do to the contract, which tells me they've agreed with Aaron Rodgers on, OK, if, if we can make this work with the contract, would you play for us for this? Yes. But his decision still has not been made. OK, so they've worked through what they want for Aaron Rodgers um, on the Jets side. It's not that the Packers have not agreed upon that. Now, what do we know for a fact right now? The Packers have said they would welcome Aaron Rodgers back if he wants to play in Green Bay. Guys, this feels a little bit like Mike McCarthy and Brett Favre. You know, McCarthy wanted an answer. Like, hey, when Brett came storming back through the doors and he wanted to, he wanted to, you know, continue to play for the Packers, right? When he did that, what did what did Mike McCarthy said? Are you fully committed to this team? And Brett would not commit. This is after he began talking to the Vikings too, and it should have been tampering charges and blah, blah, blah. We've been on that road. But we know without a shadow of a doubt what Goody and them have said is the Packers would welcome him back if he wants to play in Green Bay. I personally don't think that's going to happen. I'm to the point now where I feel like he's probably either going to be traded to the Jets or he's just going to retire. I kind of feel like he's to the point where it's not that he doesn't want to play in Green Bay. I think it's two different factors. I think it's he knows this roster isn't Super Bowl bound. Therefore, he wants to try to have a shot at winning the Super Bowl, and he feels like maybe the Jets might be a little bit better position, although I don't think they are, and I think that's why Aaron might lean towards retiring. Um, but also, I think he wants to let Jordan Love have his shine. I mean, that's what it feels like. Um, I've been watching clips on that and the way that he and Jordan Love have gotten close and, and how he's treated Jordan Love way different than Brett treated him when he came in the game or came in the league and all that. And that's kind of what it feels like to me. I kind of feel like now there's there's little to no chance he comes back to Green Bay. It's either going to be retirement or traded to the Jets. So that's what we do know, though, is the Packers would be willing to welcome him back. With them being willing to welcome him back, 
Aaron's weighing out the pros and cons between the New York Jets and the Packers. That's what we're at. That's where we're at right now. He's going, okay, is it going to be worth it to go play for the Jets, and do I have a legitimate shot there? Okay, no. All right, do I want to come back and play for the Packers? If the answer is not 100% yes, the only other option is retirement, right? So what people are overlooking here, in my opinion, everybody wants to bash Brian Gutekunst in the front office. <clears throat> but in my opinion, the Packers are in the freaking driver's seat. You understand they have the rights to Aaron Rodgers. They've already got the cap situation figured out, right? And if they think Jordan Love is their guy, then they're going to sign him to an extension. That's probably something else that's on the table. Again, keep in mind, we've got until May before the fifth-year option has to be decided upon, right? So if they do know that Jordan Love is the quarterback of the future, which all signs indicate that they are really, really confident in Jordan, seeing that they're ready to move on from Aaron if Aaron doesn't want to be there, then – they're in the driver's seat here, guys. Like, remember the report that came out a little while back, and I didn't report it on my podcast, but I'm sure you guys heard it, where they said that if he does return to Green Bay, he would be the backup, and everybody scoffed and laughed. I'm kind of starting to think that, man, maybe maybe there was something to that. Now, would Aaron come back and back up Jordan Love? Absolutely not. He would retire before then. I honestly believe that. I don't think that he would try to take – take the Packers under with them and, and go and sit on the sideline just to prove a point. I don't. I really don't. So Goody's kind of played this right. And a lot of people are not going to agree with that, and that's totally cool. We can agree to disagree, but I'm I'm grinning going, man, Goody's kind of got him by the way most right now. Pretty – uh, it's just – it's fascinating. And by fascinating, I don't mean it's great. I'm excited. This is awesome. I mean, it's just, wow, it's – what a situation. And all these different angles, it could go either way. And as a Packer fan, it's it is somewhat exciting to kind of see this stuff unfold. It's a learning experience for everybody if you care about that type of thing. But again, they're in the driver's seat. So I just want to point that out that Zach Cruz uh, kind of uh, confirmed that what we were talking about. Let's do this. Let's move on to the next message. This comes in from our boy Goose from Canada. This is what Goose said. This came in uh, Tuesday around eight o'clock. And I told him I would use it on the next show, and I think it'd be really, really cool. And uh, it, it, I, again, we're we're getting Aaron Rodgers talk because people are asking about Aaron Rodgers. Okay, it's not because Clayton wants to talk about Aaron Rodgers. You guys know you steer the ship. You message me, email me if I feel like it's good content. We'll take it in that direction. Goose says with the possibility of being the end of Rodgers in Green Bay, what are your favorite Rodgers memories aside from the Super Bowl? I have three: R E L A X. When he said he we could run the table and he silenced the haters when we absolutely did. And lastly, the back-to-back -back MVP candidate or campaign that shut up every hater made – I ain't going to say the name, Goose. I can't do it, man. I don't want to be that kind of podcast. Made so-and-so, so-and-so eat his words <laughs> and was some of the most fun I've had as a Packers fan. Love 12 forever, even if I am ready to move on. Shoot, I forgot. I got to toss in the toss to Cook to beat the Cowboys in the playoffs. How can you not be romantic about football? He used the Aaron Rodgers quote there. Quote, how can you not be romantic about football? I hit him back and said, love it, bro. Going to add some sound bites to these on the show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my favorite moment, Goose. Um, and those are all great, man. Really, really good stuff, man. And and you're right. Rodgers made a lot of people eat, eat their words, man. Um, that's why a lot of people get ticked off when he talks about the MVP. Because the only defense they got is, oh, it shouldn't be about MVP, it should be about championships. He's like, no, you want it to only be about championships now because he's running your face. He's rubbing your face in your dookie there, bud. He's going, remember when you said I couldn't do this? Bang, back-to-back -back MVPs. Remember when you said I was washed up? Bang, back-to-back -back MVPs. Remember when you said I was the problem with the coaching staff? Bang, with the new coaching staff, went back-to-back -back MVPs. That's what he was doing. And I can appreciate it because I'm just petty enough to, to appreciate something like that. So with that being said, mine, Goose, I was it, – it, it's it's got to be Aaron Rodgers' very first start. And I was there. It was Monday Night Football against the Vikings. And you guys have heard me talk about this from time to time. And uh, it, it hands down is my favorite moment because you got to understand – we're in town for three or four days at the time. We didn't do the week-long extravaganza that we do now when we go up to Green Bay. We were two young kids broke and trying to figure out how to <laughs> just make it as a married couple. Now we're at the point where we're a little more stable and we can really 
uh, kind of go all out when we go to Green Bay. Um, and yeah, so the day before we were there, we were at the pro shop and there was several players doing autographs. If I remember correctly, and I don't want to miss, uh, miss, uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to get this wrong from a sense of inaccuracy, but I believe it was Robert Brooks and Antonio Freeman signing autographs in the pro shop the Sunday before the Packers were to play the Vikings on Monday night football. And I remember it like it was yesterday. We were in there. We were waiting on the autographs and everything. We were watching Brett Favre play for the freaking Jets. And I remember standing there in line with my wife and us looking up at that TV that are mounted in the pro shop. Pro shop is way nicer now. You know, even back then, though, they had TVs. And we're staring up at the TV, and I'm like, it, it felt like I was in a dream. I was like, how in the heck is Brett Favre throwing passes for the New York Jets? How did it get to this point? And then when you go back and watch Last Day at Lambeau, you see how it got to that point. And I, I love the 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 moment in that documentary that they did so excellent that that they really grabbed the emotion and the the uh, the gravity of the entire situation was when they said one hug or a couple hugs, a couple handshakes, and just like that, he was gone and it went silent. Talking about how he left Lambeau Field for the last time as a Green Bay Packer, he being Brett Favre, right? And, and you know, at the time, obviously that documentary wasn't out yet. It would come years later. But when I see that part, I always go back to me standing in that pro shop and staring at that TV and saying, how in the heck is he playing quarterback for the New York Jets, right? How did we get to this point? This is Brett Favre. This is the face of the franchise, right? We find out later it was because he was being an a-hole and trying to throw everybody under the bus, and that's how we go. I mean, it's just my – it's not my opinion. That's the accurate assessment of what happened. If you don't believe me, please go watch Last Day at Lambeau. But so we're – that's that was kind of the setting for that entire weekend, Goose, right? So now we're in the game, and this was in the second quarter. I, I could have sworn it was the very first pass he threw, but I guess it was still so early in the game, and I'm still on edge like – we just moved on from, you know, the three-time MVP, Brett Favre, Super Bowl winning quarterback. So many similarities in the situation. It's just amazing to me. But I'm sitting there, you know, kind of in a daze, and, and there's this this guy sitting next to me and my wife. You know, there's a lot of people sitting next to us. Obviously, we're in the bowl. We are basically – if you look at the way you watch the game on TV, you know, the camera's facing in one direction, right, you know, facing the G. So if you're if you're watching the game on TV – and this specific play, the Packers were, I believe, at their own 38-yard line. So the Packers are going from right to left, right? So if you if you're if you're looking from the TV camera, right from your couch, we're in the upper right part of this screen right now. We're in the corner of the end zone, right where the tunnel is, and we're like, I don't know, it was either 11 or 13 rows from the field. Okay, Brett Favre's face was printed on the tickets, guys, because. He was going to be inducted into the Packer Hall of Fame that day. His 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 jersey was going to be retired for that game. They'd already printed the tickets. They're not wild. Like that's how they went full steam ahead of our. We're going to honor Brett and this and that. And he, he comes out of retirement. Now he's playing for the Jets. I'm holding the ticket stuff. It's got Brett Favre's face on it. Where we're going to be retiring his jersey. And here they're going to. He's playing for the Jets this week. Just insane. So anyway, that's where we were sitting. We were real close to the field, corner of the end zone. It was 13, 30, 13 minutes and 30 seconds left in the second quarter. It was a first and 10 from their own 38-yard line, okay? So I'm going to play the clip here, and I'm going to kind of give you my account for it. But here is the actual telecast, the announcing of this pass. Um, let me just go ahead and give you my account. From the stands, I literally lost sight of the ball. Aaron throws the ball so high that I remember losing it in the sky. Like it was a bomb. And it was a play action pass, drops back to pass, and he just launched it. And when it left his hand, I, I forgot about Brett Favre for a second. It was like, whoa. I mean, it had that kind of velocity, that kind of height, that kind of everything. But let's play it here. And now they're ready for Aaron Rodgers to begin his era as Packer quarterback, a first down throw and a deep one for Greg Jennings. What a catch at the six. Pickup of 56 yards on Charles Gordon, who came in because Cedric Griffin was hurt. 56-yard pass. 
And you heard them say as they await Aaron Rodgers starting his career. So what must have happened, guys, um, is a long, long drive by Minnesota, or maybe maybe Green Bay got the ball first. They turned the ball over somehow. I don't know, but it sounded like that was the very first pass. So maybe I did remember that correctly. But that's that's deep into the game, you know, 13 minutes. Maybe it was an extremely long drive that Minnesota went on and it just led to a field goal. I don't know. I have a hard time believing that. But Mike Tirico, um, as you guys know, is on Sunday Night Football now. He was on Monday Night Football at the time uh, calling that play. But Aaron, I mean, he launched it. Play action pass. And you know how it is. That's what I love about football. Even to this day, if I'm watching a game at the house, if I'm watching a Packers game, when they do the play action pass and you know it's going to be a bomb, my everybody's got their own phrase, right? Somebody might say launch it or, you know, here comes a bomb or whatever. Uh, I always scream at the top of my lungs to the point where my wife does now too, and it's hilarious. We say, load it up. <laughs> load it up. You know it's coming, right? And we're on our feet. Here comes the bomb. So when that happened, we all stood up, and it was just like, woof. He let that thing go. And like I said, it went so high, I lost it in the sky, and then just seen a crowd of people. And then all I hear is, <sighs> it sounded like a bomb went off in Lambeau. It was absolutely awesome. And I remember turning to the guy next to me, right? And the guy next to me, he literally looks at me. He puts his hand on my shoulder. He reaches over my wife, puts his hand on my shoulder and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. We might have something here and shook the crap out of me. And I was thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. We might have something here. And boy, were we right. So that's one of my, if not my favorite memories. That along with this next one I'm going to play, okay? And it was literally like two plays later, third and goal from the one-yard line, 10-15 left in the second quarter. And as many people that get angry every time we throw on third and goal from the one, right? Think of all the times we've converted that, guys. I mean, come on. It's amazing how when something works, you never talk about it. But when something fails, it's, boy, I can't – what a stupid call, right? They get it right, you don't even talk about it. They get it wrong, what a dumb call. Fire everybody, cut everybody, trade everybody, right? But again, this is a third and goal from the one-yard line, 10-15 left in the second quarter. Let's hear it. The throw down here. Oh, boy. Touchdown. Corey. Does it? Does it remind you of him at all? Yeah, that was far. Like, okay, are you happy now? And are the now? people in here ecstatic? And do yeah, you because feel the Packers right. scored. And you got to let it go, Tony. And the game is joined at this point. The game is joined. That's a far line right, throw. Right. I'll go into the football. That throw was absolutely phenomenal, guys. If you could see it, I'm going to try to share it when I tweet this out, but you guys go watch it yourself. You can find this on YouTube. Just, just YouTube search Aaron Rodgers' first start. And again, that timestamp on that one is 10 15 left in the second quarter, third and goal from the one yard line. Rodgers drops back. There's nobody open. He scrambles left, pressure comes left. He turns his body back right and literally off balance throws across his body, guys. He literally throws the ball. He has to square back up, but in the opposite direction, away from the defender that's coming. And he throws this ball somehow over his left shoulder with his back three quarters of the way turned to the line of scrimmage. Over his shoulder, spins completely around in the opposite direction to watch him complete it. And of course, Corey Hall made the old fullback made an absolutely phenomenal diving catch. Um, it just the place went nuts, man. And I've shared this video. I've got both of those plays, Goose, that I just told you about. I've got both of them recorded from the stands. And if you'll remind me on Twitter when you get when you hear this podcast, just tag me and say, "Hey, man, post those videos. Remind me. You know, I want to see them." I've got both of them from my vantage point, and I actually did a pretty good job catching both of them too, especially the touchdown catch is just phenomenal. It's You can actually see everything from the opposite end zone because I'm zoomed in with a decent camera, and it's, uh, man, what a throw, what a play. So, you know, the place went nuts, and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. But what it seems like, guys, honestly, you know, history is coming to an end here for Brett, or for uh, Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. You know, it, it seems like it's here. Whether it's retirement or trade, um, who knows? Uh, we're going to find out real soon. Uh, like I said, you guys, by this time, if you listen to this podcast on a regular basis, you know how I feel about this, man. Um, you know, the, uh, I'm just kind of – I'm just happy that both the organization and Aaron Rodgers 
agreed that whatever the decision is, they'll make that decision together. And if they decide to move on, there's no hard feelings. Um, because that was tough to see the fan base split. The fan base was already split last year, and that's what really ticked me off because, in my opinion, it was one side that was trying to pin the majority of the blame on one guy. And isn't it amazing that those same people are always screaming, it's a team sport and he's selfish and he don't go to OTAs and blah, 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 blah. And when things go wrong, it's it's all his fault. And those are the same people that will not even entertain the thought that he carried the team for so long. How many years did he have to play with a bad defense, right? Um, you know, I was putting a highlight reel together, and I'm going to share it with you guys on Twitter when the decision is made if he does leave. I think you'll enjoy it. But so many times on that highlight reel watching him connect with Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb. And when they cut Jordy Nelson loose, the thing that ticked Rodgers off, you know, when they cut him loose, it proved to be the right move in my opinion because you're not going to sign him for top wide receiver money when you knew he was starting to decline. You know, the knee injury took a toll, but the rib injury, I think more so than anything, made Jordy gunshot. He didn't seem like the same player after he broke his ribs in that playoff game, right? But the point that Aaron Rodgers was making, like, you didn't even offer him anything. You didn't even make him an offer. A guy that did so much for the organization. And I, I'm sorry, man, if that if that makes me a bad fan for connecting with that, dude, there, what's amazing is people people will get mad that Aaron Rodgers did that, but then they'll turn around in the same breath and talk about how they love Jordy so much. Like, Aaron wasn't saying he should get top receiver money, but it's like you couldn't offer him $3 million, $5 million, you know? And and you're not going to convince me that he couldn't have been the number three or number the best number three or number four wide receiver in the entire league. Now their argument immediately comes back to what well, Aaron wouldn't treat him like that. He would make him be the number one. He would just throw him the ball all the time. I don't know if that's true or not, but you see all this this highlight reel that I'm going to share with you guys, you know, later on, on Twitter, and it's just Jordy Nelson, Jordy Nelson, Randall Cobb, Randall Cobb, Jordy Nelson, Randall. Randall Cobb was the second highest graded wide receiver on our roster last year. And this is, what, four or five years removed from when they run him out of town? And it's like, granted, they weren't going to give him the $10 million per year that Dallas did or whoever it was, Houston, whoever it was that, that originally signed him. I get that. But to the best of my knowledge, they didn't offer him anything. Um, I don't know, man. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. But I'm starting to kind of understand those feelings a little bit. Like, dang, man, that is pretty messed up. And when I went down that walk down memory lane, it was like, wow, man, those guys, they did so much for the organization. And they don't hold it against the Packers. It's it's business as usual. Maybe I'm too emotionally attached to certain players. But, you know, it's like Brooks said. I don't know if she's listening to this specific pod or not, but Brooke in Illinois said a long time ago, man, it's hard for me to tune in to podcasts when everybody's being negative. And I relate to that. She said because these players are like as silly as it sounds, and this is her words, not mine, and and I feel the same way. I don't think it's silly, Brooke. I, if anything, I think it's silly. I feel this way, but it's funny. I agree with you. Like, this is your team, man. These are the players that you root for, right? And when other people are talking so negative about them, and it's just, you know, Aaron Rodgers getting death threats and all that stuff, and the toilet bowl guy talking to me, he's never going to take you to the Super Bowl and all that. It's like these are like family members. These players feel like an extension of your family because they bring us so much joy to watch this game and football being the ultimate team sport and on and on and on. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but, again, if this is a little too heavy for you, Understand, this isn't – I'm not a media member with a podcast. I'm a Packers fan with a podcast, and that's what this is always going to be. It's going to be no holds barred from a fan's perspective, how I see the team, and along the way the most important part is people like Goose, people like Jack and other people, on and on, Brooke, everybody who's messaged us, and Mike and every one of you, too many to mention. It's going to be us as fans sharing this experience together recording and having something we can look back on as well. But you guys steer this shit more than I do. You add way more value to the show than I do. I promise you that. And I really, really appreciate your time. So thank you guys for the message. Really appreciate it. We're going to get out of here. Um, again, I'm going to look at Twitter one more time. I don't think there's any update. Um, combing through here. Don't see it. Tom Silverstein. Okay, I'll correct that again and leave Twitter for the day. The Packers have picks in these rounds. First, uh, first round, number 15. The second round. 
Um, they got one pick in the second round, one pick in the third, one pick in the fourth, two in the fifth, and four picks in the seventh. Overall numbers on the latter picks are to come when the NFL releases the official list. He's talking about compensatory picks. And there is no trade information as of right now. Our good buddy Rob Westerman over at GBP Daily, Green Bay Packers Daily. If you guys aren't following them, you, you've got to be following them because they, they got a huge following. They're absolutely phenomenal. Um, he just confirmed the Packers received two compensatory picks for this year's draft. They're getting pick 170 in the fifth for MVS and pick 256 in the seventh for Chandon Sullivan. So those compensatory picks are dropping. No new Aaron Rodgers news. With that, we're going to get out of here. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. If you're listening to this on Friday at work, hopefully the information isn't too delayed, and we really, really appreciate you taking time out of the work day to make us a part of it. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world, and go Pack Go. On the fake, Rodgers lets it fly, has Watson, he's got it on his feet, and he's in it for the touchdown! That might be the biggest catch of this young receiver's career from Christian Watson. You can see him, it's just press man. They talk about his speed, his ability to get behind the defense. It's just a matter of can he catch it. That's a great job tracking the ball. He just took a big sigh of relief. Look at his buddies greeting him on the sideline, man. That's got to feel good.